Well, I decided what sermon I'm going to preach tonight. I talked to Becky. I said, I have two. She said, just I appreciate you preaching one, not both of them tonight. <laughs> and so... <laughs> and so you're going to hear a sermon that some of you have already heard. Uh, Mike heard it first with me at uh, Timothy Barnabas. And I'm, so it's a sermon that touched my heart. I re-preached it for senior luncheon. Who was there? Here just they, and they asked me to preach it at church. And then uh, I spoke about this at our men's outing. And so uh, it's going to sound a little familiar, but I think it's time for me to preach it to the entire church on, on service. And so open your Bibles to 2 Samuel, the 23rd chapter. 2 Samuel, uh, Mark Hoover, pastor of New Springs in Kansas, Wichita, Kansas, uh, gave us this information, and it was a blessing to me. I know it was a blessing to Mike. And we're just talking about battles. Battles. Uh, I will say it again, but uh, heroes don't make battles. Battles make heroes. And uh, I want to talk about those kind of things. And in, in the 23rd chapter of Samuel, uh, on the top of my Bible, the title is David's Last Song. It's his last words. David's about to die. And uh, what do you do when you're about to go on? You're about to leave this world. Well, what David does is he starts telling stories. He starts telling stories about incredible things that's happened in his life and people that were incredible in his life. I have a fellow police officer, brother, um, Dennis Bradshaw, who I think has selected to stop all medical help for him and go be with the Lord. And I've been getting calls. I've been getting calls from police officers because it went out on Facebook and someone on Facebook said, Mark Morton has helped our brother Dennis to go on to the alumni in heaven from RPD. And it thrilled my heart, but uh, I wonder how many of them know the Lord. And uh, his funeral is probably going to be here. And so uh, I get another chance to tell my fellow brothers. And every time I think of that, I think of how many stories we have. How many stories we have, and we start telling stories. And we'll tell stories about Dennis. Dennis has a bunch of them. But uh, I remember whenever I meet up with police officers, they tell this story about me. It happened when I was about a year on the department. And sometimes stories mark you. And um, there was a, a guy on, off of East Taylor Street on about 2 in the morning who was um, peeping Tom. And so I, can't, I marked off in the area and snuck in there, and I, I caught the guy. And he took off running from me. And when he took off running from me, I said, Reno, I'm in foot pursuit. I'm going up East Taylor. And, oh. Now, these were fleeter days. I was a lot faster then. And uh, the guy was running up. So I said, I'm going to catch you, man. I'm going to catch you. Stop. I'm going to catch you. And he ran up to East Taylor and then stepped onto his own yard. And said, ha, huh, I'm safe. Like it was base. Remember tag? I, policemen don't play tag. Okay. I said, you sure are it. Woo. And he went, hey, you can't touch me on my property. I said, you're going to jail. And the fight was on. When you think you're right, you fight hard. And we were fighting around there. And I, you know, I could hear units come into the area. And, um. And we fall on his front yard, both of us face down, but I'm on top of him. And I go to get up, and I just put my hand on his belt and on his shirt to get up, and he's getting up at the same time. He's a pretty strong guy. And so I have him like this, and he's down on all fours, and he just starts running on his fours. And I just, <laughs> I just start doing this, you know. I don't know where this is going to end, but I got him. And Randy Poti is in, on patrol, and he's pulling up 
to the scene and there's a white picket fence right here. And when the guy started standing up, he jumped and I just picked him up and threw him over the fence. <laughs> it literally looked like I picked a grown man the size of Wes Fletcher and went <laughs> like this. And East Taylor's slopey, so Poteet's headlights see a guy going like this. Woo. He went, Wharton's an animal. <laughs> Not knowing, the guy helped me a lot, you know. And uh, I saw him at the uh, Poteet at uh, Shields the other day, and he almost brought it up again. I thought, oh, here we go. We're going to go to that story, you know. And then the guy thought I was throwing him out of his yard so I could arrest him. And he stood up and went, hey, that's not fair. <laughs> he still thinks I can't touch him. Anyway, uh, me and Poteet jump him again, and we get him in handcuffs, and I book him. And I get to the station, and Poteet's saying, I kid you not. <laughs> Mark Morton picked up a grown man, threw him over a, a four-foot fence, like six feet in the air, and they began to call me um, retard strength. Okay, that's, that's what they called me for a long time. Anyway, that, that story comes up, and we start telling stories uh, because uh, we love each other. We, uh, we enjoy each other's company. And, um, and so uh, if someone's telling a story about you, don't take it personal. It is personal. They love you. And that's what David does here. And church, um, we are coming down to the end. And uh, we have some battles laying before us. And I know they're big. I know they're really big. You know, um, we're spying out the land right now like Joshua and Caleb. And, and we ought to be coming back saying, yeah, they're big. There are a lot of them. Uh, yeah, we might look like grasshoppers to them, but God has handed it over in our hands. We have no reason to lose hope. And uh, we ought to be more like that, as Joshua and Caleb are, because we're entering difficult times. Uh, let me just give you a list of difficult times that we're having. One is, we have a hostile culture. Have you experienced the hostility of our culture, and it's getting more and more finely directed. You know, we're getting off the Republicans to the Christians. It's kind of moving away from maybe some politics to ideology. And what's moving this movement? That's becoming more hostile. Um, we have a, a distracted audience in the church. We have cell phones. We have iPads. We have a busy, busy, busy life. We have a distracted life. We have many, many kids that are completely distracted from what's going on in their life. They cannot keep it together. And we have a distracted audience. Um, on the whole, a church is not healthy. The church in America is not healthy. We are not doing well. The church is full of the world. The church is inviting the world in. The church is bringing down the gospel. The church is doing Bible light. The, the church is really getting sicker. And it's not healthy right now. We need a revival of repentance so bad. And I'm talking about me. And so we, we need this. We have a post-COVID culture now as what this pastor called, and I agree completely, the Great Reset has happened. 25% of Grant Hills Baptist Church are not coming back. Just get that in your head right now. We had a restart, and, and maybe we needed one. The disheartened, 
the ones that maybe aren't serious about really what's going on with the Lord in this world aren't coming back. They're fine drinking their hot chocolate and coffee and their cinnamon roll and watching it online. And they're not going to come back. It's been a, a restart. Not only that, fewer men are doing what John Nelson is doing, and that is being called into the ministry or hobby or bike or myself. That's becoming rare. A church our size, uh, having a, a, a young person uh, go into the ministry like Annie or Javi or, or um, John Nelson is an incredibly good numbers for a church our size. But uh, a lot of churches don't even let anybody preach anymore. You know, we're professionals. And so only the, the professional, like I'm professional, uh, get to preach. Uh, things like that. We, we have a, uh, uh, a theology that this is theotainment instead of raising disciples. And so we don't have, we have fewer men surrendering to the call of the ministry. And I think lastly, Satan is turning up the heat. It's becoming warmer uh, in, the, in the bad sense in our culture today. And so, especially when we preach about Christ's return, we need to do that more. We need to start thinking more about that. Because Revelation 12, 12 says this, has come with great wrath, knowing his time is short. And so, things are heating up. And for me, it makes me a little excited. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting, um, uh, as a policeman, I, I, I use a lot of police stuff, you think? Yeah. Anyway, when I go on scene and you're a policeman and you're a young man and you're, you're there to save the world, when someone wants to fight, you go, <laughs> this is going to get fun. I remember we had a, a big Samoan man. Like, I'm talking 350 pounds, having a fight with his wife. And he left the house, went down downtown Reno, and started a fight with a policeman. And so the policeman called in everybody. And I remember John McCauley was there. He said, Mark, we get there. And this big, big guy says, hey, I'm having a bad day. I'm going to jail, but I'm going the hard way. And all of them went, wow, this is going to be fun. And he started throwing cops. And John says, man, we're fighting this guy. He's fighting this guy. And he says, finally, he says, John is my size. He says, he picked me up to throw me, and my gun went flying in the air. Oh my. And it landed right at his feet. And everybody stepped back and said, what are you going to do about this? You know, John's like, that's my gun. And the guy just went, Whoo. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> he was there to get rowdy. And, and he goes, man, we all went, oh, this is a great guy. You know, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he's just having a bad day. You know, hey, um, when things get tough, we shouldn't get so depressed. The Lord's coming. Hating, Satan's heating it up. I know we can't control the culture, but we can control our area of life. All right. And so how about we work on us? And so we see these battles coming out. David's going to uh, uh, just talk about some of these great men in the Bible. And so let's look at verses 9 and 10. And I'm not going to have you stand because I'm going to be bouncing around a lot of it here. So in 2 Samuel 23, 9 through 10. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo. I'd just like to have a dad called Dodo, huh? <laughs> That's a tough one, huh? Um, the Aharite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines who had gathered there to battle, and the men of Israel had withdrawn. That means they took off running. But not Eleazar. He arose and struck the Philistines until his hand was weary and clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to strip the slain. Can we pray? Lord, would you uh, 
Help us to remember all the battles you've won for us. May you encourage us, Lord. We've been through a lot. And you have been faithful. Would you help us as we just glean some things from this piece of scripture? Thank you for Brother Hoover preaching this to me. I needed it. And I pray that, Lord, you would just uh, encourage our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Eleazar is a mighty warrior. And the enemy comes, and it's so powerful in their face that they withdraw, and Eleazar goes, come on. And I don't know if you've ever worked something like, um, I, I, when we were building the church here, we had a, a, a packer box ground. I think it's the old style because uh, I'm sitting there packing going, wow, this thing's shaking me like crazy. And so I, you hang on to the thing, and I think I probably did it wrong. You're supposed to just let it work. Do it and I'm doing this. And after an hour, I go to stop, and I go, I can't open my hands. All right? It's clung to the side of the shaker. I don't know, packer, whatever it's called. And I have just clung to it. This is what Eleazar did. He grabbed his sword and he starts swinging and he's taken down the enemy and his hand is clung to the sword. He can't let it go. It's cramped onto there. And what that means is that he had a calling in his life and he didn't let it go. And pretty soon what a calling does is when you grab onto it, it grabs onto you. And church, I just want to tell you, in these battles we're having, the first thing we must do is grab onto the call God has given us. And pretty soon, that sword you grab onto will grab onto you. And you will be able to do things that obviously only the Lord can do through you. We have a, a, a real, it's a mystery when you get called to be a Christian. I watch people just, I ask them, how, how did you come to Christ? And they go, wow, I mean, some of it I, I can't understand. I said, amen. It's a mystery how God just plucked you out of your family, isn't it? Isn't it a mystery how God just grabbed you out of this whole world? And yet, with that mystery is some certainty. And the Bible says the gates of hell shall not prevail over the church. We need to grab onto that. We need to grab onto that. And I think when we do that, it'll grab onto us. Satan wants to take you down. Do you know that? You know, he's going to use three different things to take you down. You need to write these down. All right. You need to have these available to you. The first thing he likes to do is he likes to disqualify you. We see it with the temptation of Christ quite a bit. But he just wants you to mess up. He wants you to fall into sin. He's going to disqualify you. And we see ministers and deacons and church people being disqualified in moral ways. We just watched it with Southern Baptist Life this last week. It's heartbreaking. Me and Mike have talked about it a bunch because we just got done with what I'm preaching here. The, the head man... Uh, Brother Hunt had to step down. A great guy. But we have, we have to remember that the devil wants to disqualify us by us doing something wrong. Well, if he can't do that, if you're going to hold the ground and you're going to say, no, I'm going to obey the Lord. I'm not going to do this. Satan get behind me. The next move he makes is he going to discourage you. He's going to bring great discouragement in your life. He's going to start telling you things on how messed up you are and how it's not going to work out in your life. It'll never work. And you will have bouts of depression and you'll have spiritual attacks that will seem strange in your life. He'll go after your kids. He'll go after your spouse. He'll do whatever he can to discourage you because you've got to stop serving the Lord. It's having too much impact. If he can't do that, if he can't disqualify you, if he can't discourage you, he'll try to deal you out. 
You say, what do you mean? Deal you out. He will offer you something really good so you don't do the great thing. He will do this. It happens. You, you know, uh, you could be really rolling and you're doing Sunday school in this church and, and God is doing some great things and your boss says, hey, I'm going to give you a $50,000 raise, but you're going to have to work Sunday. And you go, hmm. Because the devil's done. He's tried to disqualify. You won't. He's tried to... He's tried to discourage you, you won't, and now he's dealing you out. And so you're going to be $50,000 a year richer and spiritually poor. You know, a couple years ago, um, a church called me to be their pastor in Texas. A lot of money. Uh, an opportunity. Um I think when something like that happens, it's kind of like, wow, okay, well, let me pray about it. I think I need to pray about it at least. And I pray about it, and, I, it, it, you know, the next few days, uh, it, it doesn't come up in my memory till noon. I think there's a problem. I mean, I, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to pray about that. The Lord would not release me at all. I think the devil wanted to deal me out. And so, church, um, with this calling comes big opportunities. Granite Hills is sitting right now at one of the best places we've ever been. We have people joining our church that are discipled. We have people coming into our flock that are serious about the Lord. And so we come to this place of opportunity, and I'm here to tell you there's only three kinds of pastors and there's only three kinds of preachers and churches. The first one's risk takers. We have to take risks. If we don't take risks, we become caretakers. To be very, very frank with you, I think during COVID, I fell into a caretaking kind of pastor. <coughs> and it's not fun. It's not fun just kind of, well, let's maintain. Because after the caretakers is the undertaker. We put this thing in the grave. That's what we do. So church, we have a calling before us. We are going to, in this next year, take some risks. And we're going to give God a chance to show up. How about we step out? How about we look at that two acres and we say, let's go for it. Let's do something and impact, impact the culture here. I'm done really big. Be the caretaker. It's old. I'm done with COVID. I won't do it anymore. I'm ready to take a risk because people are just perishing all over us. Are you feeling that? I need you to. I need you to pray for it. And you need to look. Church, we have a sanctuary and we can't fill it. We build that and we impact the community and we start helping children this one will come afterwards faster. That's easy to... Brother Fletcher said we would pay that off in seven years. It was a million bucks. I said, no way. I think it was six and a half years we paid it off. We need a million dollars to start that. And I feel like the Lord gave it to us. $900,000 for an acre on Stead Boulevard, and we got two acres for $84,000, and it's paid off. What's, that sounds like the Lord to me. And so we, right now, uh, I know there's a tense, you know, all the, all, the, all the battles going on. We want to step back. I think we need to step into the fight, and let's be risk takers. The Lord brought about a great victory, it says in verse 10. He grabbed onto the sword 
and he kept his calling. We're called to something we cannot win on our own. A million dollars. <laughs> I don't have it. You have it? Maybe all together we could, huh? But I bet the Lord knows where a million bucks is. I bet he does. In fact, I think he knows where more than that is. It's not achievable for us, but we need to give God a chance to show up. And so how about we step out and say, God, we, we think you can do this. And we think this is it. And our, we're out of Sunday school space. I see lots of purple chairs here, but we're out of Sunday school space. We got to do something different. Hey, let's go to the next one. Samuel 23, 11 through 12. Now after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, a Herite. And the Philistines were gathered into a troop where there was a plot of ground full of lentils. That's a beans. All right? And the people fled from the Philistines. But he took his stand in the midst of the plot, defending it, and struck the Philistines. And the Lord brought about a great victory. Here's the question. This is about little things. When does a bean field become a battlefield? When does something so unremarkable as a bean field become a battlefield? Let me tell you when it does. When the enemy takes a stand there, there's a reason for it. The enemy took a stand in our ground, and it seems simple, like maybe we should just let him have it, but he said no. I know it seems like a little thing, but this bean field is now a battlefield, and we're going to take a stand there. And I think what this really, really speaks to us on our battles today is, do you have some little things that need to be beat in your life? You know, little, little things now are taking us down. Alcohol. You got a loose view of that in your life? And it's taking you down. How about moral looseness? Have you slipped away? I mean, the enemy's really, really wanting to get in there and, and take this little bean field in your life. And it's time to fight. Maybe it's your mouth. That came up in our men's ministry, several people. How we speak, cursing, things like this. How about greed, materialism? Ah, uh, you know, you got to make a living. Yeah, but wow, it's taken over your life. How about pride? I think uh, Brother Hoover said this very well. He says, the Bible says, you know, there's dead flies in the ointment, but I think there's dead flies in the anointed. We need to get them out. We need to get these dead flies out of our life. It's... It's corrupting our life. I think we need some holiness. And I think that's the beginning of really taking some good risks and saying, what is in my life? Is that maybe you need to go to celebrate recovery and say, I got a few dead flies I need to talk about. Um, the third and last thing, and I must close here, Second Samuel 23, 20. Man, look at this one. Then Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man, Kebezel, who had done mighty deeds, killed the two sons of Ariel of Moab. Those were mighty, mighty big dudes. And this is a little short Jewish man. He also went down and killed a lion in the middle of a pit on a snowy day. When it comes to battles, church, you must get ready for a battle that comes from a lot of different sides. I was talking to Terry Fletcher the other day when Miss Carol Crawford, I thought of this, by the way, Miss Terry. She goes, I said, man, she just had knee surgery and they're having this, and Joe's had a stroke here almost, and, and now Carol fell and broke her hip. She goes, Pastor, several of our people in our church are getting piled on. What's this? You know, it's one thing to fight a lion, but how about we hop in a pit with it? And how about we change the atmosphere and make it a snowy day? 
we, we have a line, a, aggression that's real. I mean, we got an enemy in front of us. And then we're stuck in the pits. Not only that, it's a bad location, it's a bad day. We feel trapped. This is only going to end one way. Either a lion's coming out of this or I'm coming out of this. Have you ever felt that? And this man, what did he do? I think we need to go back to Eleazar. I think he grabbed the sword and started swinging. I mean, he started swinging. It's time to fight. It's time to fight. We used to trap stuff and chase stuff down with hound dogs. When a bobcat... When you got a bobcat down, he gave up. He gave up when he started to lose. A raccoon, we need to be raccoons. When the raccoon started losing, he went, hey, hey, and he started fighting. And he'd get up, and he'd get mad, and he got with it. I thought, man, that's a tough little creature. Hey, we need to start swinging. This pastor was trying to change some things in his church and get his people to look outwards and do some stuff. And he, he said the deacons called the deacons meeting. He's got a church in, in, in Wichita. At that time, was running about four or 500 people. It's running 7,000 now. But he said when it was that way, he said the deacons called a meeting, 15 deacons. And he said, I, I got the shirt. And we sat down, and he says they were in a big horseshoe circle. And they just went down one at a time telling him how messed up he's been. He said, one man says, you know, in the Bible it says uh, that a king would do good in the beginning and then he'd turn wicked and kind of mess up. I think that's you. He says, only two deacons stood up and said, you know, I think when you preach, you preach from the word of God and you preach from what God's telling you. I'm, I'm, with, I'm with you. He said, that day... He felt like he was in a pit with the lions on a snowy day. And he went home and he says, Lord, as he prayed in the basement all by himself, I would consider it a personal favor if I didn't wake up in the morning. Have you ever been there? Lord, I just think it'd be, a, it'd be just a total personal favor right now if I just went to bed and didn't wake up. Church, that's when we need to start fighting. That's when we need to start stepping into the battle. That means something's really going on, and the devil doesn't like it. You know what he said? All 13 of them deacons were gone in 21 days. Wow. He said, you don't have to beat them. You just have to outlast them. Um, you might be going through something like that. Would you bow your heads? If you're here today and you are struggling with your calling and you know that you need prayer because you need to grab that sword and you need to grab onto your calling and that's been a, a difficult thing for you lately. With every head bowed, would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me, that's me. Yeah, many, many hands, yeah. Thank you, brothers and sisters. How about you, brothers and sisters? Uh, are there some little things? Is there some flies in the ointment? Are you, uh, you thought it was a little thing, this alcohol or moral looseness or greed or your language or your pride, that the Lord is calling you to repent of? You say, Pastor, pray for me. That's me. Now that was me. Yes, yeah, yeah. Amen, amen. Lord bless you. How about you? Are you having... <laughs> <laughs> a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Are you getting hit from all sides? And you are thinking about throwing in the towel. Now, church, that's a big, big thing for me to ask you. But if you're feeling low, this pastor would really want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand and say, that's me. I'm feeling that. Yes, my brother. I've already prayed for you. Anybody else? Lord, we come before you. We thank you. I thank you for my church. Thank you so much for giving us this great opportunity to serve you. 
to be a blessing, that this, com- this church would be a bright star for the glory of you, Lord Jesus, in this community. May we take the risks. May we stop being this maintenance type of, of ministry, Lord. And Lord, we're not always. There's many of us that are doing this. They're taking risk. And I thank you for that. Help us to all look towards you. Lord, bless us. Lord, be with the little things that we think are little. They're really bringing us down. And Lord, be with my brother who's really feeling hit on all sides. And he's thought about throwing in the towel. Lord, help him. Stand him up. Encourage him. And Lord, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we go, would you stand?